Here we go. All right, everybody is wandering in. Keep on wandering. The doors are being closed. It's 10 o'clock. We're ahead of schedule. I'm looking back at the clock back there, and it's 9.59. We're ahead of schedule. Joshua, good work. Can't hold anybody accountable for being late yet because it's only 9.59. There goes Olivia hustling to her seat. You didn't think you were going to get a play-by-play -play with this morning's announcements, did you? Here comes Kim. Welcome to the party. Oh, boy. All right, 10 o'clock, here we go. Good morning, welcome to Prairie View Christian Church. We'd like to thank you for joining us today. Whether you're here in person, you're watching on live stream, or you're going to catch it maybe later in the week. My name is Craig Hunter. I'm one of the elders here at Prairie View, and I'm excited that you're here to join us. If you are a visitor with us, there might be one of these green cards someplace nearby you. Go ahead and fill that out. Drop it in the uh, box a little bit later on when we do our communion and our offering, and that'll be how we can follow up uh, with you in the way that uh, best suits you. Give us whatever information you would like. Got a handful of announcements before we pray, and then I turn things over to uh, Zach and the, uh, the worship team. So you might notice our volleyball net out there. It's uh, going to come down within the next couple weeks. The season is finally over. We stretched it out as far as we possibly could as there was a diehard group of seven of us uh, this past Monday that had to stop due to darkness. Uh, so it's, again, we started with, oh, I don't know, 35 to 40 people back in May, and uh, we whittled it all the way down to, uh, to seven or so. And you know what we discovered during that time that there are some folks in this room right here that are physically capable of playing three-on-three three or four-on-four four volleyball instead of six-on-six. Six. So next year, instead of just having our traditional Monday night six-on-six six volleyball, we're going to branch out and we're going to do another night that it's going to be a little more competitive and have groups of threes and fours. So uh, you won't hear anything about volleyball, which I'm sure will make a lot of you happy, um, but several of us sad. You won't hear anything about that probably till next March or so as we put that season behind us. That being said, we do have a pretty busy calendar. I want to uh, just give you some of the, uh, the updates. Youth group today after church, you can see Zach uh, if you are interested in that or if you know somebody who might be interested to see how uh, we minister to our uh, school-aged uh, children here at Prairie View. Next meeting for youth group is a little bit of an irregular schedule, October 27th, and that's to work around fall break. So we go today and then again on October 27th. Uh, women's group meets today after church right out in the lobby at 11.50. That wraps up at 1.20, and you can see Mary Pafford right over here if you are interested in that. And a slight change to that schedule as well. We will meet, we will, the ladies will meet again on October 20th out there. That's a little bit different than what it says in the bulletin. So they'll go today, and then they'll go October 20th. And we want you to know, if you're not signed up, that's okay. Show up on any of those dates. If you don't have a book, that's okay. We'll get you one. Um, all the ladies are welcome at as many or as few of those meetings that you can make. Our men's group meets on Friday mornings here at the church from 7 a.m. to 8 a.m. out in the front lobby. Uh, we'll meet again there Friday the 18th. Uh, you can see Joe Finnamore, who's not here today. Uh, but if you have any questions about men's ministry, you can see Joe or anybody with a name tag, and we'll do the best we can to help you out. Fall Bonfire is coming up on Saturday, October 19th, 5 p.m. That is one of our best attended events of the year. That happens right out in our backyard by the pavilion there. You can see the fire pit. So we'll have that available on Saturday, the 19th, 5 p.m. There is a sign-up sheet out on the desk. Uh, looks like we still got some work to do to make sure we have uh, plenty for everyone. So if you're planning on coming, we're excited. Uh, please visit the sign-up sheet to see what it is you can do to contribute. And then also, that's a great time to bring family, friends, neighbors in a really no-pressure uh, environment where folks can uh, just socialize and get to know one another. And that really it closes out uh, the month of October. But, you know, as we are now in, uh, in the retail world, we call it uh, Q4, fourth quarter. That's where we try to 
to make all of our money. Uh, there's a lot of just busy things that go on in uh, the fourth quarter of our lives. So we'll do the best we can to get those calendar uh, events to you coming up. So as you're planning your Novembers and your Decembers, you can put things on there like when is the congregational meeting going to be? When is Parents' Night Out going to be? Uh, when is caroling going to be? So we'll work hard as a group to make sure we get those dates to you as soon as we possibly can. So that's it for the calendar. That's it for the announcements. Um, I'm going to read a verse out of uh, Psalms 100, verses 4 and 5 to kind of kick off our time together. Then I'll pray. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His, faith, his faithfulness continues through all generations. Please pray with me. Dear Father, we just uh, thank you. Thank you for Sunday morning. Thank you for this time together as a group to partake in such things as uh, worship, communion, um, to sit and listen to your word, um, to fellowship together. We thank you for the ability to worship here. Uh, we thank you for Ben and Zach and Nancy and all the work that gets done all week long to make certain that we can do this. We thank you for the so many volunteers um, that call Prairie View Christian Church their home. Uh, whether it's folks that uh, got here early to make coffee or people that are in the side hallway there teaching our children. We just know that it takes a lot to do church here on Sunday morning. Father, uh, my prayer this morning is that every single person that walked in this room come in with open minds and open heart and ready to receive your word. Father, we thank you for Sunday morning here at Prayer View. We thank you most of all for your son Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Well, good morning again. If you are able, would you stand to join us in singing? And before we do that, we will read another scripture verse this morning. It is Matthew 11, 28 through 30. It says this, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light.
Next reading this morning comes from Romans 8, 1 and 2, and then Galatians 3, 26 as well. I say, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. the highest king will welcome me. I was lost, but he brought me in, oh, his love for me, oh, his love for me. Who the sun sets free, oh, is free. Repent, therefore, and turn back, that your sins may be blotted out, that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Are you hurting and broken within? Overwhelmed by the weight of sin, Jesus. 
Jesus is calling. Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Leave behind your regrets and mistakes. Come today, there's no reason to wait. Jesus is calling. Bring your sorrows and trade them for joy. From the ashes, a new life is born. Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar the father's arms are open wide forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of jesus christ oh what a say Isn't he wonderful? Sing hallelujah, Christ is risen. Bow down before him, for he is Lord of all. Sing hallelujah, Christ is risen. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. So come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood. Bear your cross as you wait for the crown. Tell the world of the treasure you found. Amen. Thank you for singing. You may have a seat. Good morning. My name is Joshua. Craig was cruel earlier when he was teasing you about the date of the congregational meeting, as though we don't already know. It's December the 8th. Mark your calendars. How dare he. If you're a visitor among us, as soon we will have the opportunity for you to fill out the green card information. We'll collect an offering. If you are a part of the regular 
group of people that come here. The offering is for you to contribute uh, to the work of the church, especially if you're a member. We're also about to have our time of communion. If you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you are welcome to celebrate that with us. Uh, well, all, once I pray, everybody will file up. You'll collect a, a combo pack of bread and juice, and then you can take that back to your seat and uh, reflect and pray and take that when you're ready. And then if you're feeling extra indulgent, you can take it to a trash can yourself when church is over. We are pushing into the book of Nahum in our sermon series. Typically, when we do the announcements in the communion, we try to stay far away from the sermon text. If there's one verse, uh, there's a bit of good news for God's people. And when the Lord delivers this news, one of the things he says is, celebrate the feasts. You're going to be in the land a little while longer. What's coming is not coming yet. Celebrate the feasts. And the reason I bring that up is that uh, there's spring feasts and there's fall feasts. And this past Wednesday marked Rosh Hashanah, the first of the year. It's the first day of the seventh month. They start their years in the seventh month. And it marks the beginning of the 10 days leading up to Yom Kippur, which will be on Friday, the Day of Atonement. I'm going to read a little bit from Leviticus chapter 23. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, and this is the first they would ever heard, like, hey, you are my people, I'm your God. These are the feasts that I want you to celebrate. Passover was mentioned earlier. When we celebrate communion, it's most reminiscent of Passover. But there's something from each of the feasts in the work of Jesus that we remember. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the people of Israel, saying, In the seventh month, on the first day of the month, last Wednesday, you shall observe a day of solemn rest, a memorial proclaimed with blast of trumpets, a holy convocation. You shall not do any ordinary work, and you shall present a food offering to the Lord. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, On the tenth day of the seventh month, that'll be on Friday, it's the day of atonement. It shall be for you a time of holy convocation. You shall afflict yourselves and present a food offering to the Lord, not do any work. And there's more information on the day of atonement. I'll save that now for whoever's doing communion next week, if they want to go that direction. But the Feast of Trumpets, there's no... Nothing more given about it. It's not remembering atonement. It's not remembering the Lord passing over. It's not about harvest. It's just, hey, first of the month, blow some trumpets. And that's all that there is to it. And uh, we don't blow any trumpets these days except for orchestras and marching bands. Don't think about that. Think your phone is honking at you because there's some sort of an alert. It's Friday morning and the tornado sirens are going off, or it's not Friday morning, and the tornado sirens are going off. Your attention is needed, urgently and presently. That's what trumpets are used for. And it's for, there's an enemy at the gate, everybody get ready, or there's somebody special coming, everybody get ready, or there's some sort of uh, information. And the gospel is a proclamation. We proclaim, whenever we do this, the death and resurrection of our Lord and that there is a warning. He will be coming as judge, and a special announcement, he will be coming again with the trumpets. So when we celebrate communion, yes, we remember the Passover, the Lord passing over his people and sparing them, sparing us, but we also remember that it is an announcement. Not that we celebrate with trumpets, we celebrate quietly and reflectively, but it is a celebration, and it is a warning and a proclamation that Jesus died for our sins, and we celebrate it together. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this chance that we have to gather. Thank you that we can look back into the Old Testament and the uh, annual cycle and rhythm of celebration and reflection that you instilled in your people, that we recognize in many ways is fulfilled in the Lord Jesus and what he did, but that we can still gather a great value from today. Lord, we thank you you for the Passover, when you passed over uh, your people covered by the blood, and we can see Jesus dying on the cross and covering our sins with his blood. And Lord, thank you for atonement and, um, and the, what all that signifies, how we can be brought back to you. And Lord, thank you for this Feast of Trumpets, the announcement that you have come, you are coming again, and there is good news to be shared uh, in that you have died for the sins of your people on the cross. Lord, as we take this together, may we remember that you have died for the sins of your people, and uh, Lord, help us reflect on what it means to be one of your people and recognize it if we are not yet among your people and come to you uh, for the first time in repentance, seeking the assurance of salvation. Lord, thank you for the baptisms we've celebrated the last few weeks and uh, the visible demonstration of the beginning of new life and the cleansing of the conscience. And Lord, thank you that each week we set aside time to remember what you have done to bring Bring us to you. It's in your name that we pray. Amen.
Good morning again. Welcome to Prairie View Christian Church. Thanks for joining us here today. Is a message of violence, destruction, and even death ever good news? Our first answer to that question might be no. But upon further reflection, the answer is surely yes. When a patient who's undergone months of radiation and chemotherapy hears that those treatments have successfully killed the cancer in their body, that person doesn't grieve. They rejoice. When the contractor you've hired tells you that the stubborn mold in your walls has finally been eliminated, you don't mourn, you celebrate. Or when citizens of countries occupied by Nazi forces heard that Adolf Hitler was dead, do you think they wept or did they exult? A message of violence, destruction, and even death isn't always bad news. It really just depends on who or what is getting destroyed and who or what is doing the destroying. And the book of Nahum is primarily one of those messages. Violence, destruction, and death. God is acting in judgment against the enemies of his people. Now, we've spent the past few Sundays going through the 12 minor prophets in chronological order. And from Jonah to Amos to Hosea and to Micah, one nation has functioned as the evil empire, the neighborhood bully, the bad guy out there to get God's people. And that's the nation of Assyria. They were famous for their cruelty. If you remember, the Assyrians had a particular fondness for pillaging, plundering, and torturing the people they conquered in shockingly gruesome ways. And one of the reasons we know that is that they wrote it down. They bragged about it, and we can still read it all these years later. And when the prophet Nahum writes this book, Assyria is at the peak of its brutal power. But Nahum comforts God's people by assuring them that God will not allow Assyria to terrorize them forever. Instead, he will display his love for Judah by judging their enemies. And in that sense, this message of violence, destruction, and death isn't just not bad news. It's good news. So open up to Nahum chapter 1, verse 1. Feel free to use a Bible here if you didn't bring one, and take a Bible home if you don't own one. But before we do any reading, let's pray together. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for this time that we have together. Thank you for your son, Jesus. I ask that you watch over us as we worship you this morning. It's very easy to fall into a sense of complacency and think that we don't really have any enemies out there because we gather week after week in this building and we sing and we pray and we read the Bible and we take communion and we give offerings. We do all these things and we face little to no opposition in the big scheme of things. But Lord, remind us that there are enemies of God's people out there. And even if the Christians at this church aren't dealing with that on a regular basis, there are Christians in other places that are dealing with that as we speak. And so, Lord, I pray that you remind us of that reality, uh, that we pray for those who are suffering oppression and injustice and all kinds of hardship from those who have not responded to your gospel. We pray for those churches and those Christians that you would give them courage and give them boldness, and give them reward for their faithfulness. And help us as we attend to your word this morning. So many of us are tired. So many of us are frustrated with things happening outside of this building. So many of us are discouraged just by the wear and tear of life in a fallen world. And I pray that you would help us be attentive to your word this morning, to come to you thirsty for 
what it is your word provides us, which is wisdom, which is cause for hope, cause for joy, maybe even some accountability and some conviction if we need that. But Lord, I pray that we would hunger after your word and that you would meet our needs this morning through your word. Thank you for your son, Jesus, who died on the cross for our sins and rose from the grave and one day will come back. Thank you for your Holy Spirit who indwells us. Thank you for the word that we get to read this morning and thank you for your church, this church and well beyond. Thank you for our brothers and sisters in Christ. We love you. We ask this all in Christ's name. Amen. Beginning in Nahum chapter 1, verse 1. An oracle concerning Nineveh, the book of the vision of Nahum of Elkosh. Unlike the other prophets we've studied so far, the opening verse of Nahum gives us next to nothing to go off of in terms of historical context, other than that mention of Nineveh, and we'll get there. But we learn very little about the prophet Nahum himself. We don't know anything about his family. We don't know anything about his profession. And we don't even know anything about his hometown. People have theories about where Elkosh was, but it's mostly speculation. However, we do get some contextual clues in other places throughout the book. For example, in chapter 3, Nahum refers to the fall of Thebes, which happened in the year 663 B.C. Well, he refers to that as a past event. In chapter 1, Nahum predicts the king of Assyria's death, which we know would happen in 627 B.C. So it's safe to assume that Nahum is writing somewhere in between those two events. And that helps us set the stage for what it is that we're reading. Now, we did mention last week that Assyria exiled the northern kingdom of Israel in 722 B.C. Micah was alive to see it happen. But then Assyria tried and failed to do the same thing to the southern kingdom of Judah in the year 701. And Judah only survived that close call by God's grace and by the good king Hezekiah's faith. But sadly, Hezekiah's descendants did not learn from their dad's example. In fact, like his son and grandson, may be the two worst kings that Judah ever had. Manasseh's reign constituted 55 years of spiritual and moral disaster. That's Hezekiah's son. And while Ammon's reign only lasted two years, Hezekiah's grandson he was no better than his father, Manasseh. But then Ammon's son, Josiah, comes along. And Josiah will be an absolutely outstanding king. But we'll have to wait until next week to learn more about him. Instead, let's get back to Nahum. But before we see what Nahum has to say about these big, bad Assyrians, there's a quick question that's worth asking. Didn't Nineveh, didn't the Assyrians repent of their sin back in the book of Jonah? You may remember the story from a few weeks ago. Despite his best efforts to disobey God, Jonah preached in the city of Nineveh. And the Ninevites, of all people, repented. In fact, they appear to be one of the most thorough and sincere examples of repentance that you could ever ask for. What's happened? Well, about a hundred years has passed since the book of Jonah. So we've got a new generation of Assyrians on our hands. On top of that, Assyria was down on its luck when Jonah came to town. So they may have been more prone to humble themselves before God at that moment. And now that things are good, now that their war machine is running on all cylinders, they may think that they don't really need God anymore. The point is this. It appears that Assyria's repentance in the book of Jonah 
as thorough and sincere as it may have been at one time, was short-lived. This is a different group of Assyrians. And because they've returned to their old ways, they once again find themselves on the receiving end of God's judgment. That's what Nahum announces. That's what nearly the entire book revolves around. But Nahum does not just neutrally announce the facts of this outcome. He celebrates it. This message of violence, destruction, and death on Assyria is good news. And it's not just good news because those people were really, truly that bad. It's good news because God is the one who is righteously bringing it about. So pick up in Nahum chapter 1, verse 2. The Lord is a jealous and avenging God. The Lord is avenging and wrathful. The Lord takes vengeance on his adversaries and keeps wrath for his enemies. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power, and the Lord will by no means clear the guilty. If you're wondering who exactly the book of Nahum is about, look again at what we just read. Who's mentioned over and over and over again? The Lord, the Lord, the Lord, the Lord, the Lord. He's the one doing all of this, not Nahum and not anybody else. The Lord's way is in whirlwind and storm, and the clouds are the dust of his feet. He rebukes the sea and makes it dry. He dries up all the rivers. Bashan and Carmel wither. The bloom of Lebanon withers. The mountains quake before him. The hills melt. The earth heaves before him, the world and all who dwell in it. Who can stand before his indignation? Who can endure the heat of his anger? His wrath is poured out like fire, and the rocks are broken into pieces by him. The Lord is good a stronghold in the day of trouble. He knows those who take refuge in him. But with an overwhelming flood, he will make a complete end of the adversaries and will pursue his enemies into darkness. Nahum's understanding of God comes from a passage that we've alluded to a few times over the past several weeks, and that's Exodus chapter 34, starting in verse Six. This is at a crucial moment in Israel's history. They've been freed from slavery in Egypt. They've gone to the wilderness, bound for the promised land, but then they fell flat on their faces by worshiping golden calves in chapter 32. But God does not destroy them. He's patient with them, and he gives Moses new tablets, a new Ten Commandments. But God says of himself in Exodus 34, starting in verse 6, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty. The prophet Micah last week wrestled with those two truths that God is both merciful Savior and just judge at the same time. As we learned, there's no contradiction between these two aspects of God's character. And in Nahum, the second part of that Exodus passage, the truth about God's just judgment is clearly in view. Unrepentant Nineveh's guilt will not be cleared. Their sins will be punished. They're about to get what they deserve. And what do they deserve? Violence, destruction, death. But notice verse 7. Nahum does not only describe God as a vengeful and wrathful judge. 
he describes him as a loving savior, one whom we should take refuge in. The God of Nahum is not just lashing out at everyone and everything wildly. He's not just indiscriminately destroying stuff. He's protecting those whom he loves. We have to keep that in mind as we read the book of Nahum. But now let's talk about another word that Nahum uses to describe God, and that's the word jealous. You know, Nahum is not the only person to describe God that way. God refers to himself as jealous when he gives Moses the Ten Commandments. And at one point, Joshua reminds the Israelites, at a time when they seemed a little too confident in their ability to obey God, Joshua reminds them that God is jealous. Of course, when we hear the word jealous, it carries negative connotations. We tend to think of an overly controlling boyfriend or an insecure rival at school or at work or a child who wants to steal their sibling's popsicle. But there are also times when jealousy is perfectly appropriate. A husband or wife should be jealous if their spouse is flirting with someone else because they're in a covenant relationship with that person. And if they're not jealous, then something is obviously wrong in that relationship. There are times when jealousy is perfectly appropriate. And in this case, God is jealous for the well-being of his people, as he should be. Assyria has designs on taking what belongs to him, and God will act against them for overstepping their bounds. And we pick up in verse 9. What do you plot against the Lord? He will make a complete end. Trouble will not rise up a second time. For they are like entangled thorns, like drunkards as they drink. They are consumed, consumed like stubble, fully dried. From you came one who plotted against the Lord, a worthless counselor. Verse 12, God seems to be speaking to Judah at this moment. Thus says the Lord, though they, Assyria, are at full strength and many, they will be cut down and pass away. Though I have afflicted you, I will afflict you no more. And now I will break his yoke from off you and will burst your bonds apart. But then the Lord shifts his attention in verse 14, and he starts talking to Assyria directly, and maybe even more specifically speaking to Assyria's king. The Lord has given commandment about you, no more shall your name be perpetuated. From the house of your gods, I will cut off the carved image and the metal image. I will make your grave, for you are vile. Now, we've already heard what Nahum had to say about God's just judgment and his righteous jealousy. But it's also worth considering what Nahum says about God's raw power. To everyone in the world at that time, Assyria looked utterly unstoppable. They were the dominant political, cultural, and military force. But in a fight against the Lord, they stood no chance. Like the mountains that quaked, or the hills that melted, or the rivers that dried up a few verses ago. Their armies will be defeated. Their king will be killed. Their idols will be crushed. And look back at the imagery in verse 8. The reference to an overwhelming flood. In chapter 2, God says that the river gates of Nineveh will be opened and that the city will become a pool. And archaeology tells us that Nineveh the capital city of the mighty kingdom of Assyria just happened to have a river running right through the middle of it. 
And one ancient historian writes that when Nineveh fell in the year 612, Nahum's prophecy was fulfilled. The river overflowed. It broke down the city's supposedly impenetrable walls. And that imagery of an overwhelming flood ought to be a little more real to us after what we've seen on the news the past week with Hurricane Helene. That's the kind of judgment that God is bringing upon Assyria. But then God adds in Nahum chapter 3, verses 5 through 9, that Assyria will be utterly ashamed. They will end up like Thebes, the city that they themselves conquered in 663. In the same way that Thebes had no chance against Assyria, Assyria has no chance against God. And guess what? When they're wiped out, no one will miss them. Who will grieve for Assyria? This prophet's name, Nahum, is the Hebrew word for comfort. But what exactly is comforting about this message of violence, destruction, and death? Nothing. Right? Well, only if you're the bad guys. But if you're not among the bad guys, if you're the oppressed and not the oppressor, then this message is wonderful news. It's an incredible comfort. Because in the same way that one man's trash is another man's treasure... One man's judgment is another man's deliverance. That's why Nahum says in chapter 1, verse 15, Behold upon the mountains the feet of him who brings good news, who publishes peace. Keep your feasts, O Judah. Fulfill your vows, for never again shall the worthless pass through you. He is utterly cut off. Back on Memorial Day weekend, we discussed the imprecatory psalms. And these are the psalms that celebrate the defeat of enemies. The psalms that ask God to take out evildoers in no uncertain terms. And as Christians, we sometimes read them and wonder how we can possibly reconcile their shocking words with Jesus' command to love our enemies. Many conclude that we can't pray similar prayers ourselves. But in that sermon, we also made a few observations. First, in the imprecatory psalms, believers ask God to take care of their enemies rather than trying to do it themselves. On top of that, when we pray imprecatory psalms, we recognize that God's justice is perfect and ours isn't. So we should probably leave our enemies to him. And we also learned that in the same way that we can walk and chew gum at the same time, at least I think most of us can, we can pray for more than one thing at the same time. We can pray simultaneously that our enemies would repent of their sin. But if they don't, that God would take care of them for us. And something very similar is happening in the book of Nahum. For God's people in Judah, with this evil kingdom breathing down their necks, imprecatory psalms make a lot of sense. For those suffering persecution, injustice, and oppression, a message of violence, destruction, and death isn't always unwelcome when their enemies are in view. And if we can't imagine a scenario where we'd pray those kinds of psalms, if we can't imagine a scenario where a message like Nahum's could possibly be comforting, then we may just be a little bit privileged. We may just be a little bit sheltered. But when you've been on the receiving end of some of the most horrific manifestations of sin ever conceived by fallen humanity then a message like Nahum's can be pretty darn comforting. 
They can even be good news. And to be totally honest, the message of the gospel may have more in common with the book of Nahum than we might think. In the Gospels, Jesus was not just a preacher of peace, love, and happiness. He gave stinging rebukes to hypocritical Pharisees, corrupt religious leaders, power-hungry Roman rulers, and arrogant fellow Jews who thought that their lineage entitled them to unconditional blessing from God. And Jesus says that when he returns in power and glory, he will not just come as savior of all who believe in him. He will come as judge of those who don't. Jesus' return will be a day of great deliverance for some and a day of punishment for others. The Apostle John's words in Revelation chapter 18 that celebrate the downfall of the wicked city of Rome. The city that was guilty of so much sin, that caused so much suffering for the early church. John's words sound a lot like Nahum's words, celebrating the downfall of guilty Nineveh. Or as the Apostle Paul puts it in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, starting in verse 14, But thanks be to God, who in Christ always leads us in triumphal procession, and through us spreads the fragrance of the knowledge of him everywhere. For we are the aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To one a fragrance from death to death, to the other a fragrance from life to life. For some people... Jesus is wonderful news of salvation. Those who take refuge in him. It's a great scent. But to other people who refuse the Lord, the message of the gospel is a stench. A stench of death. A stench of judgment. So then what do we take away from the book of Nahum, practically speaking? Well, first, we learn a great deal about God's righteous character, don't we? Namely, God takes sin seriously. He is both loving Savior and just judge, like Micah said last week. He's even jealous for the well-being of his people. And when someone else's sin puts his people in jeopardy, God notices And that person will pay. In the book of Exodus, the Israelites suffer and suffer and suffer for generations in slavery in Egypt. And then they cry out to God in chapter 2. And the way Exodus chapter 2 ends is that God heard their prayers and God knew. And you might know the rest of what happens to Egypt in the following chapters. When someone else's sin puts God's people in jeopardy, that person will pay for it. Maybe not right away, but judgment will come. And that should make us think twice about sinning against others, and it should make us think twice about courting sin against God ourselves. But we also learn about true repentance in the book of Nahum. As we said, Nineveh's repentance was short-lived. When times were bad, they responded rightly to God and left their sin behind. But when times were good, they foolishly believed that they could get away with disobedience. And how often do we make the same mistake? The crap hits the fan and we hit our knees. But then once everything's figured out, we go back to disobedience. In Matthew 12, Jesus warns that if an unclean spirit leaves a person, but then that person allows the unclean spirit to return and set up shop again, then they end up worse off than they were before. In Hebrews 10, the author warns us against believing the gospel one minute 
and making a practice of sin the next. It's the equivalent of trampling the Son of God underfoot repeatedly. And God does not take kindly to people treating his Son that way. May our faith not be fickle or fair weather. And may our repentance be true and long-lasting. And third, we learn from Nahum that the world will one day answer to God. Because if a superpower like Assyria had to answer to God, then that means that every other empire, nation, kingdom, church, and individual will too. And no perceived walls of invincibility, our accomplishments, our good works, our wealth, our insurance policies, none of those things will help us when the waters of judgment start to rise. So may we believe the gospel and be prepared for that day in the only way that we can be so that Christ's return will not be a day of doom for us, but one of rejoicing. So in a weird way, this book of Nahum, a message of violence, destruction, and death, can actually be quite hopeful. It just depends on where you're sitting. If you're in league with those opposed to God, it's dark. But to use Nahum's words in chapter 1, verse 7, if the Lord is your stronghold in whom you take refuge, rather than someone you're trying to take down, then this is good news. It is good news that evil will not win in the end. It is good news that Satan will not have the last laugh. It is good news that this fallen world will one day be redeemed. But how do we ensure that we're on the right side? The only way is to believe the gospel. As Paul says in Romans chapter 10, quoting Nahum chapter 1 verse 15, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. May we welcome those prophets like Nahum and welcome those preachers who call us to take our refuge in the Lord, to make him our stronghold and survive the flood of judgment. Let's pray. Father, again, thank you for this day. Thank you for this time that we have together. Thank you for your son, Jesus. Thank you for your Holy Spirit. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your church. And thank you for this word that we've read this morning, the book of Nahum. As tough of a pill as it can be to swallow, all these words of violence and destruction and death, they maybe rub us the wrong way at first glance. But Lord, I pray that we would also see the good news that's written in between the lines at times in the book of Nahum, but sometimes written explicitly in the book of Nahum. Nahum tells us that you are good to those who take refuge in you, to those who make you their stronghold. And Nahum tells us that the feet of those who preach the good news, those feet are beautiful. That message is good. And part of what makes that message good is the reality that evil doesn't win in the end, that Satan doesn't have the last laugh, that those who oppress and those who oppose and those who persecute your people will not win when it's all said and done. That's the hope that we have as believers. It often seems like your people are on the receiving end of suffering and hardship and alienation and all kinds of persecution, whether it's violent persecution or something a little more subtle, but no less sinister. And Lord, we need that hope. We need that encouragement. We need that joy to remember that you win the battle in the end. So I pray that you would help us be faithful. Help us make you our refuge. Help us trust in you as our stronghold even when that stronghold feels battered, even when it feels like we're being attacked on all sides. 
Help us trust in you, take refuge in you, and know that we'll be vindicated in the end. And Lord, as we said, we pray that the enemies of your people who are still out there in our day and age, even if they're not big bad Assyria, we pray that those enemies would repent of their sin, that they would come to know you. But if they don't, Lord, we pray that you would do what is right, that you would do what is just, that you would do what is appropriate to protect and care for and love your people who believe in your son, Jesus. Lord, help us go out from this service, go out from this place, knowing that you are a merciful, loving, kind Savior, a refuge and a stronghold, and that you defend us from all who hate us. We love you. We ask this all in Christ's name. Amen. Let's stand together as we sing.
As we approach the halfway point of this sermon series through the 12, or the Minor Prophets, I think maybe one of the best things they're forcing us to do as a church is to look at God in his fullness. Uh, we often have this tendency to be very selective about who God is and what God is like. Uh, some of us really want to stress that God is a just judge and de-emphasize God's mercy and grace and love and kindness. And then others of us really want to stress the mercy and the love and the grace and the kindness and kind of turn a blind eye to God not clearing the guilty and God not taking sin seriously. And the prophets are disabusing us of that tendency. Uh, it's often the case that heresy, false teaching, it doesn't come from just inventing something about God that is objectively untrue or ridiculous. Heresy often comes from overemphasizing one thing and de-emphasizing another thing. And the prophets are helping us to really have this balanced, full-throated view of who God is based upon his word. So as we reach the halfway point or approach the halfway point of this sermon series, I hope that's been helpful for you. It's certainly been helpful for me. And if you have questions about what it means to be a follower of Christ, uh, what it means to come to the Lord as your refuge and your stronghold, rather than as an enemy you have to overcome, or an enemy that you have to defeat, because you will stand no chance if you try to do that. Uh, if you have questions about what it means to make the Lord your stronghold and your refuge, uh, please talk to an elder or a pastor or just a trusted, godly believer here whom you know. Uh, I'm sure those people would love to have those conversations with you. And if you have any questions about our church, who we are, what we do, uh, we'd love to have those conversations with you and pray with you as well. But with that, I will close our service in prayer, uh, and we hope to see you back here next week. Let's pray. Father, again, thank you for this day. Thank you for this time that we have together. Thank you for your son, Jesus. Thank you for your Holy Spirit. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your church. And Lord, thank you that you are our refuge and our stronghold. You defend us. You keep us safe. You protect us. You love us. But Lord, you are not always going to be on defense. Uh, at some point, you're going to be on offense. And the enemies of your people will pay for what they've done. And Lord, I pray that the enemies of your people would repent. But Lord, we also are thankful that the enemies of your people, whether they repent or not, uh, will not win in the end. Remind us of that reason for hope, that reason for joy, that reason for confidence, uh, that reason for courage uh, in a fallen world. And help us be faithful until your son returns in power and glory, because that is the day when your people are saved and those who are not your people are defeated. And so, Lord, I pray that we would be faithful until that day comes, that we would be diligent in the Great Commission so that the number of people who are on the wrong side of things when that day arrives will be less than it is right now. I pray that we'd be faithful in preaching the gospel and persuading and challenging other people to make you their refuge and their fortress and their stronghold because they will not survive if they don't. So Lord, help us love people enough to be honest about that truth. And watch over us as we leave this place. Keep us safe keep us healthy until we can gather again to worship you. But in the meantime, help us worship you with everything that we do and everything that we say in the days between our services here. We love you. We ask this all in Christ's name. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord.